it's uh, quite uh, interesting that my uh, political awareness was really awoken when I was doing my A-levels. Uh, this was a long, long time ago. I don't wish to reveal how long ago that was, but um, I recall first becoming politically aware in the midst of the campaign against apartheid in South Africa. And um, by most accounts, if not all accounts, the student uh, movement, the British student movement at the time was instrumental to the dismantling of apartheid, to the uh, basically uh, exposing the realities, the horrors of apartheid. Uh, the boycott campaign of the, of the time was, was something that, you know, we, we, we actually took immense pride in doing. And when the student movement in the UK was, was, was lauded by the likes of Nelson Mandela, by uh, Desmond Tutu, by, you know, the real stalwarts of the anti-apartheid uh, campaign, um, it, it filled us with pride. So, you know, there's absolutely no question that um, student activism, and particularly in this country, in the UK, is an incredibly Im important tool, not only to spread awareness politically among students, but also to really bring to the fore and to, the, to society's attention the cases that are going on around the world, particularly those of injustice and the such. Is it, and I, I've been disconnected from that particular scene now for more than 30, 35 years, but would I be, um, would I be wrong to, to think that things aren't the same as back then? I mean, you're absolutely right. The student movement is, still is, um, a, you know, very important space to create cultural shifts, to create political shifts. And I think that explains why there is a focus from the government, from you know, different people, different political parties, on what is happening in the student movement and trying to influence some of that. So you know, you hear the cancel culture and you know all these things, the Freedom of Speech Act, which recently passed. All these, all these things are trying to change or trying to influence what's happening in the student movement because the student movement is so important. Mm. Um, the student movement has. Um, you know, come up with the politicians that we see today, um, they, they, they were all involved in the student movement. Um, so it's still strong, but I think there is an attempt to weaken it. Why? Because of how strong it is and because of the influence that it has, I think, um, to, bring, to bring about positive change yeah. in society. I wouldn't say it's actually an attempt to weaken it. I think it's an attempt to control it mm. because of how strong it is. It's for making sure that they have their own political, um, like individuals that have that share the same politics as, you know, the Tory government, things like that, to come back into the political, in, into student politics, because we have seen a silence of, you know, the young, uh, the Knowles, for example, the, the Labour students, the previous Labour students before the current one, um, you know, they were in control of NUS, for example, for a long time. We saw the organised, um, organised independents who were in control of, of, of the NUS, um, using NUS as a main, um, example, um, a national union of students. Um, and then now you're seeing actually they were silenced. They haven't had an elected um, officer in quite a while. And then therefore now you're seeing an attempt to control that with this, with the push of, you know, the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, forcing universities to accept it, or they get um, cuts off uh, the Office of Students um, funding and things like that. So now you're seeing it slowly coming in as this attempt to control and then bring their own politics mm. back into those um, is it, is spaces. It because, is it because traditionally the student movement has been uh, known to be anti-establishment or is it, is, it, is it wider than that? I mean, is it more expansive than that? I think the political, the student movement is known to be anti-establishment. Anti it's also mean, known to be... And by the way, that, that's not well. exclusive to the UK. I mean, no, it's not. student movements yeah. around the world where they have freedom, they will be anti establishment in a way, that's how they should be. Yeah, exactly. I mean, don't you think? Yeah, 100%. I completely agree. I think I think also another thing about students is they're quite radical in a sense that they are not they are willing to put everything on the line. Mm. Yeah. And they quite and they and they're not they're not afraid to use radical um, means. means to yeah. achieve their goals. Like yeah. for example, the rent strikes and yeah. things like that. You know, they're not afraid to do that and I think that 
does terrify the establishment. Yeah. It does terrify both major political parties um, because in the end of the day, we are the future mm. Mm. and their, their outlook on the world is start, slowly trying to, is slowly dying and they're trying to like bring it back, mm. I think. Um, uh, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, what, what you're saying, it's, it's again, bringing back um, old memories, many of them good, I have to say. <laughs> but I, I, I'm also aware of the fact that, uh, you know, whilst, you know, a few years back, I used to be invited probably mm. once or twice a week yeah. to speak at a particular event in universities up and down the country. Yeah. I think it's been about seven years since I was last invited. And when I am invited, there is always this... Uh, this campaign that surrounds yeah. uh, the whole event, <laughs> where basically I am lauded as someone who is being problematic or yeah. troublesome. And the people who invite me get into trouble with their own, sometimes even with their own lecturers. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's incredible. So, I, I think we've seen uh, more of that since um, 2015, uh, particularly when Prevent became statutory duty. Mm. Um, and the chilling effect of Prevent, I think, we're going to see more of it actually in the future, particularly after the recent uh, review on Prevent. Mm. Um, my experience at university, um, when I was president of uh, the Palestinian Society, for an example, and involved in other societies, whenever there was, and it's, you know, it's um, interesting that it's usually, usually the major Muslim majority societies will face this, mm. where their speakers would be, um, uh, delayed or the events will be cancelled um, or there is a problem with the speaker or they're, they're ha they have to go through extensive um, research, you know, background research on the speaker and sometimes you have to sign an agreement and and, and this does, you know, you're, t you're saying it's been seven years since you've yeah. been invited but as a student, you, you just end up thinking, what's the point? Yeah. Um, why should I go through all of this for me to be a target. And that is the real chilling effect. Mm. And we actually see that, it's, it's crazy. Um, you know, I have seen so many students who would like to have events on political issues or issues they, they just care about, but they just know they're going to get a lot of heat and yeah. they just say, there's no point, let's yeah. just move on. And, and how many times do we hear of students' backgrounds uh, yeah. when they were at uni uh, being dug up, yeah. their statements being you know, splashed all over the news, portrayed as though uh, these people are uh, beyond the reproach, mm. you know, they're, they're, they're beyond the pale, they're unacceptable and the such. When, you know, generally speaking, uh, our ministers, even sometimes our prime ministers, their pasts at uni are, you know, as radical, as wild, uh, as chaotic as they used to be, but but they're, they're not held to, to, to the same kind of of barometer, if you wish, or the same kind of benchmark. And, uh, and I get it, I get it. You know, when a student, for instance, feels that maybe them trying to hold this event either for Palestine or for, you know, the Rohingya, for instance, or the Uyghurs or anything else, Syria, um, that that will come back to bite them when they're seeking yeah. a career. It's, it's, it's quite scary, I have to say. I mean, the, the, the beauty of being a student and student work was the fact that, that you're scared of nothing, just yeah. like uh, Lubaba, you just said. I mean, it, you're scared of nothing. It's, it's, it's a space for you to exert yourself, to exert your personality, your emotions, your beliefs, your passions. Um, but yes, it seems that we, we are in times that are far more controlled. And uh, the, obviously, I mean, we, we have to talk about this, that uh, the student scene has been highly politicized also. Now, whilst political rhetoric, political narratives have always been part of student life, but the way in which political parties have now dominated uh, the student scene is something that's, that's you know, is, uh, I think is problematic. Would you agree? I do completely agree. Yeah, um, uh, definitely. I feel like, now there is definitely an influence of different political parties trying to like make a breakthrough into student politics and we do see especially in NUS we do see that a lot um yeah I definitely I was uh, I was taken by a story that I read uh, just a few days ago 
about uh, our Home Secretary, Suella mm -hmm. Braverman, being back in Cambridge and winning the Cambridge um, elections to become president of the, of the union. And that it, it appears that someone had accused her of some shady tactics. Okay. Um, and, um, and at the time, she being asked, how did you win this election? And she said, well, you can't really prove anything or something mm. to that particular effect. But that doesn't seem to have, uh, have harmed her prospects of ultimately becoming Home Secretary, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's really interesting because I think it's, it's about where you align yourself politically. Mm. Um, that will depend whether it come and bites you or not. Um, I think, you know, students who, particularly Muslim students, um, I would say, do bear the brunt of such actions the mm. most. Um, and um, students of colour as well, because um, they tend to campaign on things that personally affects them, mm. um, you know, such as Black Lives Matter or Palestine or, or whatever it is. Um, and those are the people who are minoritized in wider society. Um, so I think it is, it is about balance of power and where power lies uh, that determines whether these things come after you in the future or, or not. Do you, Lubaba, do you, I mean, from your experience, in your position, do you feel that um, uh, students are uh, more inclined to sort of stand back and not really put themselves forward? Or are you saying, are you seeing, you know, some, I don't know, maybe you're seeing some sort of backlash and people putting themselves forward and saying, no, 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 I'm going to stand up to this. What kind of reaction are you finding? I'm actually seeing students who just don't want to be involved anymore, mm. who are too afraid to put themselves out there, especially if they are talking about causes that are very personal to them. Because something that Shaymet was saying, like, you know, naturally our politics as Muslim people or as black people or as just BME people, our politics is naturally anti-establishment. So our existence in itself is a threat to the establishment. And I think now a lot of students have become a lot more aware of that because we don't have the support networks in place to support those students who may decide to run in elections and sabbatical offices or whatever elections they'd like to run. We unfortunately don't have the support network that we used to have, especially under Jeremy Corbyn, because under jo Jeremy Corbyn, I think being anti-establishment was celebrated. It was a norm. It was something that, you know, everybody was comfortable to be. But now when we see in the current political sphere, we've obviously we've got the Tories, but then we have Keir Starmer as well, who has cracked down on left-wing politicians, activists within the Labour Party. It just shows that actually it's a very, it's a very scary time and a lot of students mm. are... I, I just want to stick to themselves and just stick to grassroots work without being in, in elected positions and things like that. So it has been a bit of a challenge, I think, as the BME rep, um, not necessarily encouraging students to join the Labour Party, but more just to become more politically aware and to get involved in campaigns and things like that. It has been a lot more harder because a lot of students are like, mm, what's the point? Yeah. What's the point? Because... If I decide to do something and it's against, I don't know, Labour policies, then then I'm going to be kicked out from the Labour Party or I'm going to have a, um, a campaign against me on social media, um, which will then affect me, you know, my mental health and things like that. And so there's a lot more put at risk when you're a person of colour mm. with uh, left-wing politics. So I think that's really important as well because obviously not all skin folk is like <laughs> kin folk, but um, I think it's, it's being a person of colour with left-wing politics, that's like you're automatically yeah. a target. So, I mean, but th this is scary. Mm. I mean, it is very for, scary. For, 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 for young people not to be able to... Yeah. you know, to, to speak for what they believe in yeah. uh, and to exercise and put into practice certain things that they, they are passionate about. Uh, I, mean, you, you, <laughs> I mean, I think the three of us come from part of the world where, you know, politics is almost non-existent for, yeah. for, 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 for citizens. And hence, you know, the people who grow up, they grow up with absolutely no idea about political campaigning, about, um, you know, lobbying for anything, about speaking out, speaking up and the such. And um, you end up with societies that aren't really, you know, aren't really for change. Yeah. Aren't really for any kind of reinvention, mm. uh, for renewal as such. And, uh, and that's problematic to the extreme. Definitely. Yeah, it's definitely problematic. And I think... Um, 
with, with the way the wider political space is moving towards, I think we will see that in uh, within the student movement. Um, the student movement is known for its radicalism, it's, you know, for that free spirit and mm -hmm. for, you know, putting all arms in the air and, and uh, just going at it. But I think there is an attitude of what's the point yeah. now? Um, and I think we will continue to see that within the next years, I think. Is it? Only Muslim students? No, 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 no. It's not. It's not only Muslim students. It's. I think it's a wider. It's a. It's something that I've seen within the wider um, student movement, um, particularly Muslim and students who are of color. Um, but I do see it with white students as well. Who um, share left wing politics? Yeah, that's what it is. It's mainly the students yeah. who feel, share left wing politics who now genuinely feel like, what's the point? Mm. Yeah. And because, I mean, when they say, what's the point? Let me, let me pose a question. Mm -hmm. um, what, what do you say to someone who says to you, I mean, really, come on. I mean, why am I doing this? Why would I be doing this? Why would I be risking? What would you tell them? What would you say to them? <sighs> why is it important? Listen, you know, just, just, it's a valid question. Why is it important that students campaign, that students you know, put up placards displaying what they feel like. What, I mean, why is this important? See, I don't have the answer for that. Mm. And the reason why I don't is because, um, obviously, historically, like, while I was a student, so, like, I went to Westminster University, and when I was a student, you know, we had, like, cameras in our prayer rooms. We had, you know, every, every person who went to the prayer room was monitored with their cards. Our eye socks was pretty much non-existent. Islamic surgery was pretty much non-existent. Um, and at the time when I was campaigning, like then that's when I became very, very involved in student politics and stuff because, you know, I was like, what's going on? We, we got, we're, being, we're being watched at a different level and a lot worse than other universities. So that's when I got very involved. But now, talking to students, uh, then, sorry, apologies, then I felt like I was protected in a sense that my identity and my experiences weren't challenged. I wasn't being shut down for being Muslim, for having these experiences. The issue with now is that if a student comes and talks about their experiences, that experience in itself is being challenged. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where it becomes quite dangerous and, and that's where I don't know how to tell the student, oh, there, it's worth fighting because if your experience is being challenged, your whole experience, because like I'm, I'm half Palestinian, so my mom's Palestinian and from Gaza, and like I be now, I'm in spaces where I have to actually explain why, as Palestinians, we have the right to exist. That is exhausting. Yeah. That is so exhausting, and um, and I, I I I can't sit back and be like to other students or Palestinian students or Muslim students to be like, no, it's worth. De being de what's the word demoralized basically and dehumanized mm -hmm. it's worth it because you know we'll get change in the end i think it's actually a wider conversation about okay can we put structures in place to support these students and if we can then from that we can start regrowing the student movement as such and, and and encouraging students to get back involved in politics and stuff like that. But unfortunately right now our structures have been completely broken. Yeah. Um, our funding has been cut, you know. Um, and so I think from, I think that would, for me to encourage students to be involved, I need to know as a, as, as a person that's encouraging them to know that they're protected yeah. mm -hmm. and that they are, they're not putting themselves up running in these elections, getting involved, and then it, the consequences of it is detrimental and for them and for you know the wider movement. So, um, yeah, I I don't have the answer. So, you know, students have come to me, you know, a lot because obviously I'm young labour, so I do work with non people that are not students as well, um, young people as general, and they've come to me and they've asked me like, is there a point? And I have to look at them and it's like I don't know. I don't know. I think it's about holding on to that hope. Mm. And I think, I think that's the Palestinian side of me <laughs> that makes me hopeful. We have to be hopeful or then we'll all be miserable. So we have to be hopeful. And um, yeah. Um, but truly, I mean, from, from my observation, I'm, please do correct me if, I, if you think I'm wrong. Um, the pro-Palestinian movement around the country is, is quite healthy and it's growing. I would suggest. 
Mm -hmm. um, I'm, and I'm talking about from the kind of responses to any attack against Gaza, against the Palestinians, against the, the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the such. Every single time, we're having bigger and bigger crowds. And what's more interesting is that we are having more um, uh, blunt and blatant uh, statements being being made. I mean, I was I was totally taken aback at a recent event um, where people stood up and talked about uh, you know the the whole thing about the one state solution rather than the two state solution. I that never happened during my time. Yeah. I mean, during my time, whenever, you know, I tried to argue against the two-state solution, I would be shut down even by the pro-Palestinian campaigners. Yeah. So, so there is surely, I mean, when we're talking about Palestine as an example, mm -hmm. we're seeing a proliferation, maybe that's a hard uh, or, or, or an exaggerated word, but a, a, an, an expansive element to the pro-Palestinian campaign. And, and that is by far and large, I would suggest, born from the students. Movement. I think, look, um, maybe Luaba can jump in on this. Um, when it comes to numbers, mm. we have numbers. Mm. Um, every, any protests, we will have thousands of people. The issue is not numbers. Um, the issue is how do we protect those activists that then put themselves on the line for the cause? How do we ensure that these activists are not smeared? How do we ensure these activists have legal protection for an example because if you know we can have the numbers and we can if we're going to measure success by number then yeah sure we can say that we're you know we're a successful campaign etc but i don't think the measure of success is through how many people turn up to a protest i think it's about how do we ensure that our activists are protected do we have the 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 frameworks and the support mechanisms for these activists and i think that's where the movement lacks a bit. Lubaba, within your Young Labour uh, movement, I mean, do you, do you find the same? I mean, do you I've been, I, like when it comes to Palestine, I've pretty much been silenced. Mm. I, I, if I, I, I can't I, I talk about anything, or if I, I tweet anything, if I say anything, I'm having somebody message me. I've like I've been in a situation well, so saying where what exactly? I mean, what saying? Oh, uh, do you sure you want to say that? Like I've been, I've been literally. So I went to an attended. Maybe I shouldn't be saying this, but it doesn't matter. But I've, I've attended training sessions mm. that were run by left wing, major left wing organisations mm. in the Labour Party, who in their training explicitly told us we cannot portray Zionism in a bad light. Mm. I'm like. Mm, um, how, how, how can I not, like, of, like, of course I can. I should be allowed to. What's happened now is being Zionist is seen as a protective, as a protective characteristic. Mm. And they've now merged a Zionism and anti-Semitism and, mm. and they've merged the two. And now it's become even increasingly difficult to criticize anything to do with Israel mm. or what's happening in Palestine. And I think that's what, I've, even for me, like if I'm tweeting about my own, like for example, family members or my own experiences, I will have people tell me, maybe you should reword that so that it's not misconstrued as for you, you know, supporting a certain thing or, or you're calling for a certain thing. Wow. Um, so yeah, it's been very difficult. And it's, and it's even, I think it's become even more challenging because I am Palestinian and yeah. I think like, and also on top of that, I'm Palestinian, but also like my, my father's from the Caribbean and like just the rich civil rights movement from the Caribbean, like my grandmother's from the Windrush yeah. generation and like learning how they campaigned in the 50s and 60s and, um, and saw how radical in the way that they went about things. Like they rioted, they did things like that. And I, I come from like a background of, not like resisting and not being afraid to resist. Mm. And I think now me even having that kind of energy and coming into a, a political space with that kind of energy of not afraid to resist, now that's being seen as a problem mm. because I have to be polite. I have to be friends with everybody. I have to be able to, um, I'd have to, I have to be able to speak to everyone. But for, uh, for me, 
it's 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 been yeah it has been a very I don't know where I'm going with this but I have been it has well, been definitely cool, I mean, very cool challenging. Naive. I, I totally understand what you say yeah. because I, I hear it from from young people. I mean my my sons uh, one of them has graduated and the other is still in his third year. But um, uh, I mean they tell me about the kind of pressures that they they come in for. Um, but you know what what I find problematic from a purely a conceptual point of view is that uh, the point, the whole point of going into university and going for a degree is because you you create a particular discipline in how you think. Yeah. Okay, there's a methodology. There's 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 an, uh, an approach that is rational. There's that is reasonable yeah. um, uh, to your thinking, yeah. and and therefore I find this extremely difficult to align that with one's capacity to criticize a government's actions and not conflate it with yeah. the government's, let's say, overall religion or religious right. identity. I mean, for instance, I wouldn't dare uh, call someone who criticizes the Saudi, Arabia, uh, Saudi Arabian government as being an Islamophobe, mm -hmm. yeah. despite the fact that Saudi Arabia happens to be a, a Muslim yeah. nation. So, so, I mean, that is where I find it problematic. You see, because on one hand, I'm training these people so that they become, in life, they become positive assets that think, you know, according to rational, reasonable, logical means. But then on something so, you know, volatile, such yeah. as the Palestinian question, I'm telling them, no, forget about rationale, forget about logic, forget about mm -hmm. reason. You know, this is how you should behave. It's, it's deeply problematic. I mean, we see this in wider society as well, um, you know, for an example, the proposed uh, BDS bill. Um, I mean, the government were very quick to, and, and rightly so, to um, boycott Russia and yeah. to call, you know, other bodies to boycott yeah. Russia. But when it comes to BDS or boycotting um, the, the Israeli government, they, they want to introduce a bill to, to criminalize that yeah. and make it legal. So you, you see this sort of double standard and you see this sort of confusion mm. um, in wider society. And I, I, I do go back to what I said earlier, and I think it does depend on where you lie within the political spectrum mm. and what your, your political ideology is that yeah. makes something acceptable or not acceptable. Mm. Let's uh, depart a little from, from Palestine. Um, ov obviously, it's, it's probably the most heated topic yeah. within the international politics uh, discussion. Um, obviously, there's other things like China, like, mm. uh, you know, um, but, but let, let's stay away from that. Let, let, let's just bring it, ho bring it home a little. What are British students concerned about today? I mean, I'll tell you what I thought 15 to 20 years ago, and that was student loans. Okay. Okay, yeah. that was student loans. And at the time, we had um, successive labor leaders, mm. at the time some of them prime ministers, who promised that they would work hard at either reducing or probably even eradicating student loans. Yeah. The Liberal Democrats, for instance, for years ran on the ticket of yeah. eradicating student loans. Uh, only a month ago or so, Keir Starmer came out yeah. and said, we are rubbishing that, basically, mm. we're, we're throwing that uh, away. So uh, for, for someone as old as I am, is a student loan still an issue that students think about? Or is there something else that they're worried about locally? I think it's student loans and the cost of living. Those are the two big things. The reality is if you talk to an everyday student, they're not talking about Palestine yeah. to you. They are talking mm. about the cost of living and they're talking about the loans. And I think the, in, in the new system that's going to be implemented in September as well. Um, and I think that is the two biggest things. That is, mm. yeah. Are there campaigns going on about student loans? So the campaigns, so the, the campaigns on student loans is about making a Sharia compliant campaign. But I am the view that we should be as Muslims campaigning for a free education. Nice. Um, I don't think necessarily campaigning for a Sharia compliant system actually solves the issue. Yeah. Um, it's, I think we should be campaigning and joining forces with other groups that are campaigning for free education. Yeah. I think that should be the goal. Um, but I know is there a sizable campaign for free education? <laughs> or has that bus yeah. left already? I've, again, it's the politics of it all because the, the organisations that were quite big on that free education stuff turned out to be quite dodgy individuals. And I think that then 
died out that whole yeah. group and that whole campaign. Um, but it's still something that, you know, I know like as uh, Labour students and young Labour, we like we released a statement um, challenging Keir Starmer on his... Uh, on his stance on, on free education because that was something that he ran on the election yeah. for and obviously he's done another U-turn. Um, but th- I guess it's, uh, it's, a, it's a challenge because it's, um, you're seeing now two groups. You're seeing one that's obviously arguing for free education, one that's uh, talking about Sharia compliant uh, uh, loan system. The Sharia compliant loan system campaign has seemed to be a little bit more successful because I know that they're now starting with like MPs and things like that. But I, w- I would love to see the two join forces mm. and come and, and call for a free education mm. because um, I know, yeah, I don't know. I think... Maybe 15 years ago, there used to be, you know, one or two campaigns that all students, no matter where they are on the political spectrum, they would all unite on. That no longer exists mm. within the student movement. And therefore, you have different pockets and groups of students campaigning on different things, um, whether on a local level or on a national level. Um, I personally haven't really seen anything major when it comes to um, free education um, campaigns. Um, I've definitely seen um, local campaigns um, uh, when it came to rent strikes and reducing uh, rent. um, And that has been relatively successful in certain universities. Um, And um, those students are, they're radical students. And actually I've seen Uh, For an example, Manchester rent strike, Um, they have been really successful or really radical that they have posed a threat to the institution. And a number of their students are now facing disciplinary. Mm. Uh, But they have occupied buildings. And I've seen this, especially during COVID, um, a number of university students would occupy buildings or they would, you know, rent strike. So I think those local campaigns are bit more successful than yeah. sort of national ones where you have all students from different political spectrums coming together. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like that's the case anymore. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, w- the way you're describing the, the student scene is, uh, I have to say, is almost totally different from the mm. scene that I'm, I, was, um, I was part of and I was aware of. But obviously, I mean, this could be said of many aspects of our life. I mean, we're talking yeah. about politics, for instance, yeah. and the kind of po- political discourse that is now um, overriding is, uh, is totally different from the one that, uh, you know, we were at or we were in the midst of mm-hmm. um, in the, the mid-90s to the early 2000s and the such. Um, so, but at the same time, I mean, I say this, but on the bright side, Mm. um, I see more and more Muslim students coming to the fore, becoming leaders, elected as presidents of uh, either student unions at various universities or even on uh, uh, the NUS level, yourself, uh, uh, Malia... Malia Bouatia. What's her name? Malia Bouatia. Uh, and um, Ali Milani was, was Ali there. Milani, yes, Ali Milani as President. well, and various, uh, you know, various other other people who who were absolutely who gained the trust of their peers mm. and were elected to higher positions. Now that must be good news. That must be great news. The fact, uh, Lubaba, that you're part of Young Labour's BAME. I mean, that's yeah. that that speaks a lot. Yes. Uh, you don't seem convinced. I, 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 I'm not, I'll be honest with you, I, I'm not convinced. Mm-hmm. I don't think having more faces that look like us in, in, in different positions is it necessarily means that's it, we're like, we're there. We're, we're there. Mm. I think even like looking at our government now, yeah. you know, the Tory government, there's quite a lot of obviously um, yeah. uh BME people in the in the in the yeah um, the prime minister the, yes. and the prime exactly the prime minister is uh, mm. Indian, but do, you, do are we seeing things getting involved? If not, if anything, we're seeing a complete U-turn because we saw how a couple of months ago was it a couple of months ago when they were talking about grooming gangs and things like that and they were targeting Asian men, yeah, even though factually that's completely incorrect. Right. Mm. But then the, we've got an Asian woman as the Home Secretary and an Asian man as the head of, um, uh, as the Prime Minister. So 
does it mean it's a good thing? I, I personally, I'm not, I'm not convinced it is. No. If anything, I think it's actually doing the opposite. It's showing that actually, oh, we, we don't need to be campaigning anymore. We don't need to be involved That's in politics as more anymore because we've got people now in government that can do it for us. Um, and this, and this, so yeah. Uh, I think, I don't know, Shay Matt, if you have a different opinion, but even for me, like, yeah, I might be the BME rep, but even within my role, I'm being censored left, right and centre. So mm. is that a good thing if I'm there or not? So, mm. Mm. I mean, I, I completely hear what you're saying and I, I do agree with you to a large extent, but I, I don't want it to be a thing where people like us feel that they shouldn't go for these roles. Um, I think it will definitely come with challenges, but <coughs> I think particularly as Muslims, um, we're told to always stand up for the truth no matter what and to, to fight for injustice um, and to, to care about our society and to, to campaign for our society. And I, I'm just wary that this idea of, well, there's no point of us going to these positions. I'm just worried that the consequence will be people stop running for these positions and then we're back to square one. Mm -hmm. I do think having, like Milia, for an example, she was the first Muslim, you know, NUS president. NUS celebrated its 100th birthday last year. Yeah. Um, so Milia was the first president after, what, about 90 years yeah. of NUS? Yeah. And for me, I think, despite the challenges that she went through, but that is a huge, huge success mm -hmm. because it paved the way for people like Zamzam to, to run, for me to run, mm. despite everything. So I, 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 I completely agree with you, but I, I think it's a, it's a balancing act. Um, I do think it's really important for people of color, Muslim students to, to put themselves forward and to create a positive change in their respective roles, whether it's you know, in their student union or, uh, or other. I'm finding, I'm f uh, again, I mean, do correct me, but uh, I'm finding that more and more young Muslims particularly, men and women, um, are exerting themselves throughout all facets of life in, mm. in, uh, in the UK. And I'm talking here about business, I'm talking about um, um, engineering, I'm talking about art, sports, um, media, mm -hmm. politics. Um, and that surely is a good sign and surely um, is born from people's um, uh, experiences whilst they were students at university. I mean, I'm pretty sure that that had uh, some sort of impact on them. What you say, uh, Lubaba, is extremely interesting because uh, what you're talking about is iconism, is basically, or symbolism, or even tokenism. Mm -hmm. I mean, probably yeah. the fact that there is a, um, a BME prime minister might give um, the racists within our midst um, the goal to say, well, there we have it. We're not racist after all, yeah. you know, we're, we're, we're a fairly uh, decent people and we don't need to campaign yeah. for equal rights anymore because we have the top job given to someone yeah. from, you know, yeah. for, from an Indian descent. But so we haven't, let's say we do have an Indian prime minister, but then one of the, the, the first black women MP has now been pushed aside in the yeah. Labour Party, mm. Diane Abbott. Diane Abbott. Yeah. So that, that's where I'm, and that's why I am very torn as to whether is it just enough to have just our faces mm. there, but we're now we're seeing mm. how Diane Abbott, who most probably I am convinced that the Labour Party will also stop her from rerunning in elections, yeah. if not this uh, um, uh, cycle of elections, next cycle of elections. Yeah. So. And she was, she's a beacon of anti-racism campaigns. Absolutely, in, yeah. in absolutely. The, I remember in Diane the, Abbott from, exactly. I don't know when, a long, long time ago. She's but, always been there. Exactly, but then it shows like yeah. the, the stage that we're at in yeah. politics. Are we, we're going backwards. We're, we're definitely Well, listen, are. I mean, if we're going to talk about that, we might as well talk about how Labour treated its own leader. Yeah. Who 100%. almost became prime yeah, minister. Exactly. And who brought about it, you know, several hundred thousand new members. Yeah. Exactly. And made it the biggest political party in all and of Europe. And that had a ripple effect on student politics yeah. as well. Like mm. so many students were getting involved and, yeah. and were campaigning and felt confident in the way that they were campaigning, things like prevents and things like that. They, yeah. they were so confident to campaign because they felt safe because yeah. they knew yeah. they had a Labour Party mm. that would have their backs. Yeah. Um, 
if things went went wrong. But now, because we don't have that, yeah. we're now seeing that's that's had the, that the students are very like leaving the Labour Party, leaving yeah. politics as a whole, saying there's no point. And I think, yeah. So uh, tell me this. I mean, this is interesting. Yeah. <laughs> when you talk about people leaving the Labour Party as a result of what's going on, um, do you see them heading towards any other political party? No. No. Just be becoming apathetic? Yeah, like, I think it's... That's, I think that's what will make the next general election actually very, very interesting. Mm. Um, because I feel like a lot of people, a lot of young people are are struggling to choose a party to vote for. Yeah. Mm. Um, I know others are saying, oh, it's better to vote for Labour than the Tories because, you know, at least, you know, the Tories are no longer in power. But I don't know if that's an, a, be, a, be, a good enough example mm. um, or ex explanation as to why you should vote Labour. But... Um, now that would get me in trouble, I just realised. But it's all good. <laughs> if I get expelled, I get expelled. Because I really should be. <laughs> encouraging people to be voting for Labour but anyways um but um yeah look people don't know like because Lib Dems definitely students won't be no. voting for Lib Dems like really? absolutely they, not they there have, was a time when students com would actually go yeah, to, the, no. to the Lib Dems yeah Lib Dems they've completely yeah. ruined that relationship with is students. it because of the the fact that they went into yeah. government the, yeah that was yeah. it that's, yeah, yeah that's that's, that's the exact reason right. because yeah. they did campaign for a free education yeah. they brought so many students in and so many young people <laughs> loved Lib Dem yeah. so many people were voting for them yeah. and then they got into power well and we obviously he was obviously deputy prime minister but he was still in a power of influence yeah. and then instead of even just keeping the tuition fees for itself, it. they tripled it. Yeah. So um, <coughs> it just shows. So Lib Dems, I don't think students will go yeah. for. Green Party, I don't know. Yeah. Who else is there? The SNP, I know SNP is very popular among it's Scottish Scotland. students. Right. Um, just SNP in general, they're very mm. popular. Um, but no, I, I don't know who students will be right. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite fascinating. I mean, the way that we're talking, we're, we're, we started off talking about the student scene. Mm. Yeah. And about, you know, how it used to be, mm. the, the kind of influence that's exerted not only here in the UK, but around the world. Yeah. Um, and then we moved on to the challenges faced by students, particularly Muslim students. We talked about the impact of campaigning for issues such as Palestine. I mean, in, in your case, very close to yeah. your heart because mm. of your mother, um, but still how difficult that was. The kind of ramifications and implications that would befall anyone who, who raised their voice or raised their head um, above a particular benchmark. Um, and then how all of this is impacting society. And I think mm. that that's where I started mm. with. I started with how essentially the leaders of today were the students of yesterday yeah. and how they themselves were fruits of a very vibrant political yeah. scene within the student movement or the student scene, but how they themselves are now working in order to suppress that yeah. and to change that. It's like, you know, the, the old uh, story about, I don't know whether, they, you know, you know this, uh, being as young as you are, but you know how uh, you use the democratic ladder to get to the, you know, to the upper floors, and then you kick the ladder away. Yeah. Mm. So in a way, that's that's what we're seeing. We're seeing that, you know, people who benefited greatly from that vibrant scene now closing it down. Yeah. And it's uh, it's absolutely absurd. Okay, let's talk about um, uh, about the future a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we talk, we talked a little bit about how how uh, students would uh, would vote, but. Generally speaking, and, and even those who say, listen, I'm not going to really campaign, I'm not, not going to raise my voice, that doesn't necessarily translate that these are people who are uninterested. Yeah, yeah. no, 100%. They are interested. Yeah. But, the, but, but my worry is, how is that passion or belief, in whatever cause it may be, how, is, how does that translate? I mean, how does that come forth? How does that student vent? I mean, that's, that's what I'm, I'm concerned about. But that's where grassroots yeah. campaigns come in hand. Um, yeah. Like one, one campaign that I can just think about is the Forefront Project, yeah. which is an anti-knife crime, uh, you know, project. But it also creates a space for young black boys to come and talk about, you know, their experiences with the police and their experiences with gang violence and things like that. And I think it's those little gems yeah. that 
have become such a vital space for our youth. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I think that is where like we would be seeing students go and the youth, the youth go to um, when they need to talk about their So basically and, we're talking about community projects. Yeah, yeah it's community so, projects, yeah. Okay, so yeah. what else? What else? What else is there? I mean, can you give me some really bright, shining examples of how students can get involved in uh, inventing um, about stuff which, uh, in, w in which they believe? I, look, I've definitely seen a shift um, of students um, sort of going towards their grassroots campaigns. Mm. But I've also seen um, students who identify a you know, particular issue on campus mm. and they group together and they campaign about it. Um, there, you know, students are, there's a growing number of students who campaign in solidarity with UCU, for an example, um, and- Sorry, UCU? UCU, okay, um, trade is? union. Um, oh, electors. Yes. Okay, um, you need to spell these things Sorry, oh, yeah. <laughs> university college right, okay. uh, union. Um, and uh, th there is that, um, really amazing and beautiful partnership between lecturers and students. Mm. Um, you know, students have um, campaigned with their with their lecturers um, on you know fair working conditions and better working yeah. conditions. You see students campaigning on um, supporting the caterers and cleaners, for an example. Uh, this right. was a campaign that I supported at my university, mm. for an example, um, to bring up the cleaners and caterers in house. Um, you know better pay, better pensions, better, um, you know, sick pay, all these things. So there are pockets of local campaigns that I see students um, taking part in. Um, and these are more campus-based mm. ca uh, campaigns, I would say. Um, rent strikes. Uh, yeah. I, I think the rent strikes have been really successful. They, a lot of universities- up and down the country? Yeah, up and down the country. Yeah. A lot of universities took part in rent strikes. Yeah. Um, occupations. Um, so I, I do think there are students do identify issues on their campus or in their universities, and then they try to organise together to to bring about a positive change. But in terms of like a, a national campaign, a more structural, organised campaign, unfortunately, I, I don't I don't think they work anymore. I, I've definitely haven't seen students engaging in in some of those. Um, I've seen students um, campaigning um, locally again on their campus to decolonize, whether it's you know decolonizing the education, the curriculum, whatever it is, um, and, and raising awareness about you know anti-black racism. You know th these things on a on a campus level. Are, I think are the are, campaigns against racism are they still there? Are they vibrant? Are they, yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah? I mean, is it all under Black Lives yeah. Matter, or is it something that is autonomous? I think it did come about before Black Lives yeah. Matter, it was definitely a conversation that was happening, yeah. um, decolonization and things like that. And I think Black Lives Matter as a movement it obviously helped. picked up yeah. a lot of momentum and right. it pushed, it was good like, because well, I was a sabbatical officer at the time mm -hmm. and it was good weapon to use in rooms, <laughs> like um, just sitting there and be like, well guys, so what are we doing for Black Lives Matter? <laughs> so we got to make sure we decolonize the curriculum. Even though I was having those conversations beforehand, mm. but, um, seeing that there was so much there was so much focus on 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 especially the bme uh, yeah. attainment gap as well yes, i think that yeah. was uh, that was another thing that yeah. was a very big deal as well especially at westminster when i did a research paper on it and at westminster in fact it was students who were coming with the highest tariffs so those students are coming with the highest grades that were leaving with the lowest attainment. Oh. So it was 100% structural. And mm. you know, when you put these facts in front of them and then talk about things like Black Lives Matter, their lives, their experiences and encounters with lecturers and police yeah. and things like that, then it was, yeah, it helped so much. And it really, yeah. I was able to get the university to put out like a public um, statement, but not just a statement, it had commitments in it as yeah. well. Mm. Because that was another thing. A lot of universities were putting out all these statements, yeah. but there was no commitment to it. But one thing I did tell my university, I was like, we're not going to just release a statement. I want you to list 10 commitments on how you are going to improve the experiences of black students on your campus. Mm. And that's what was done. Um, and I think... Yeah, that was something that it really, really helped, um, like allowing 
so that was definitely something that allowed students to get involved in yeah. as well. I think a lot of students felt like, oh, this is definitely something I can get involved in. Yeah. That wasn't too political. That wouldn't lead to too much backlash. Yeah. Um, and a lot of students were involved and a lot of students were loving, you know, doing the different campaigns and talking about how they'd love to see th these kind of books in the libraries. Yeah. And, and it was really great um, moment to bring involve all types of students who students who are not not politically involved in that sense but it's because that's their experience yeah. that they felt like it was something that they can get involved in so um you see yeah. i mean that's the thing i mean when we talk about campaigning at university it's not just uh, some um sort of silly pastime it's actually uh, grants uh, a discipline yeah. A skill, a skill set, teamwork, mm. uh, you know, things that you you look for mm. when you apply for a workplace in the yeah. future. They ask you about all these things that you should have harnessed mm. and gained back at university. So so it's, it, it, it is incredibly important. But, mm. you know, I want to spend a few minutes on your, how you see education, education as a system in our country right now. I mean, the UK used to be at the forefront of, global education people used to you know seek and dream about coming to the uk mm. in order to gain degrees because they were then you know lauded around the world yeah um the the question that i have and from you know what we said about student loans and about the burden of of an education today i was you know my my son oddly uh, the other day he uh, he said to me uh, do you know how much i'm going to be owing when i graduate so I thought to myself, I thought, I said, is it 40,000? He said, double that. He said around 80 to 90,000. Yeah. And I have to say that sort of led me to calculate, okay, so, you know, what kind of job does he need to work out and for how many years yeah. for him to pay that back? But regardless of that, are we creating a system whereby there are the haves and the have-nots? Are we creating a society where education is the privilege of the few and the dream, unattainable dream of the many. Is, is, is that where we're heading? I actually, I think we're heading to a society where there are alternative ways mm. to education. Mm. I don't think university is no longer the dream, but it doesn't mean that they're not able to attain and are not able to achieve. Um, I think one thing that the government is doing all right with is investing a lot in apprenticeships and um, alternative education. Well, they used to, I don't know if that, I don't know what Rishi Sunak's planning to do with that, but you know, they did invest a lot in that. And I think I know a lot of students and a lot, a lot of young people that are doing apprenticeships and are, are doing so much better than students that are in mm. university because- Are we talking financially? Financially, but also skill set wise oh. as well, because mm -hmm university unless you're involved in all the extra stuff university is just a degree yeah. that's being taught to you mm. but when you're doing things like apprenticeships you're learning on the job you're getting skills you're learning all of it and you're able to demonstrate it so much better yeah. um and i know even like when i was in the experience of like um on the other end where i was hiring people as part of my sabbatical officer role one thing I did is like, okay, they have this master's in that, but then when you actually look at the CV, they don't really have much work experience. But then I've, I've seen students who, young people, sorry, who didn't go to university, went straight into work, mm. got all these different experiences and are achieving so much better in the workplace. So I do think now there is a shift and there's a shift definitely in alternative education and an alternative, um, alternative routes than just university. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's still a very new concept for a lot of people, but I know even financially, like um, one of my, my husband's very good friends, you know, he got, he did a year 10 work experience, one week, mm -hmm. and he got poached from that. And now he's a major graphic designer wow. traveling the world and on six figures and he's 27. Mm. So, um, and he never went to university. So I think there is definitely like, I think it's important for us as like young people to actually have that conversation about alternative education because I know I'm having that with my sister-in-law as well. I'm like mm. telling them, mm, do you really want to go to uni? Because there are all these other things mm. as well that you can do. Mm. Um, I don't know about you. I, but I, there is definitely a shift um, and there is like a big talk on alternative education. Um, and I do think it will become bigger in, in the future. But in terms of university, I don't think 
university used to be, um, you know, benefit the the few and, you know, yeah. th what you mentioned. Um, but actually, you see more students going to university. Mm. Um, it's become easier to go to university, um, you, you know, but the problem comes after, after. Yeah. Yeah. it's the debt you leave with. Yeah. How many years do you have to work to, yeah. to pay back? Um, and I think that's when it becomes difficult because going to university doesn't necessarily translate to you having a good paying job. Yeah, of course. It doesn't. And I think that's where the issue lies. Okay, guys, that was fantastic. Thank you. And thank you. <laughs> Mashallah. How do you think, what do you think of that? It was very fast, actually. When <laughs> yeah. you said it was an hour, yeah. I thought it was going to be very yeah. slow, but alhamdulillah, it went really well. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you good. so much.